Baruch Atad and I, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushan of a Mitzvah Tav, it's Yivan Ola, Sok Bedefrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who, who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in word of Torah. Okay. Um, so, here we got another, uh, thank you, uh, Chuck Swindoll. For coming up with a little chart here that uh, that kind of shows, you know, this this is directory and it looks a lot like the one we had for the same format that the one we had for uh, uh, Joshua, and it just talks about the different chapters and and uh, so forth and what uh, what their major themes are and and uh, stuff like that. So. Um, and then I put, uh, I found this little timeline of, um, you know, kind of a chronology of the ju of judges, their their timeline, and where the the different judges, um, you know, where they uh, fit into thing, and they, and they overlap. Uh, it's not a, a chronological, you know. Th there's not like a succession, like a king or something would be, to where you have, um, you know judge number one and then he dies and judge number two comes in and he dies and, and no it, it, it wasn't like that at all the judges um they actually grew uh or they they came out of uh, basically a need and and when there was a need god would appoint uh, or somehow they would be appointed uh you know sometimes it, like gideon where he had an angelic visitor come in and says, okay, uh, we need you. And um, so that's that's kind of one of the, the things that um, I never never really uh, thought about before was the, the sequence of the judges, whether they were all just one right after another or did they overlap? And yes, they did. They, they overlapped. And the reason for that was that some of the, uh, some of the judges then um, – I mean, when they when they were judged, they were a judge for that tribe, and none of the judges ever, um, none of them ever, um, you know, united the other tribes together like a, you know a whole united Israel. You get maybe Judah and Simeon, and Judah and Benjamin, or uh, and a couple of places they had Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, all together, but uh, other than that, there weren't, uh, there were not a united front as it, as it were. Okay. So, um, I'm just, I thought that, uh, in this, this morning, uh, to this evening, we'd talk about kind of an introduction to what, what we're going to be looking at. Uh, the, uh, the author, we don't know who the author really was, but, uh, traditionally through Jewish sources, uh, it's been said that it is uh, um, Samuel, and it kind of makes sense that it could be him because he was probably one of the foremost uh, of the judges, and and certainly the most uh, uh, godly of the judges that uh, that we had. And um, the uh, the time of the writing, again, you can't really nail it down. So it's caused such a it's such an uh, ancient book. But if Samuel wrote it, it would be uh, probably somewhere between 1051 and, and 1021 uh, BCE. Um, and um, then uh, the, the message of it basically is uh, the moral and spiritual decline of Israel. You know, they had a high point when they came into the land and uh, the people followed, uh, followed the Lord and so forth. And, but, um, you know, they just went from there and down as a steady decline down into um, kind of a, a moral abyss. And that ended in the, uh, well, the book ends with the appointing of, um, or the time frame appointing of Sam, uh, Saul as the king. And that's the end of the judges. So Samuel was the last of the judges. Now, um, the um, the judges. It's a Hebrew word, soft team, soft team, um, 
and uh, you know Moses was kind of like a judge, but God had told him, you know, through if you remember the story where uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, came in and said, "Man, you're you're working yourself to death here, trying to judge all of the things that these people are bringing up to you." Said, uh, uh, "Appoint judges out there for the." you know, in the congregation you know, of people over, you know, thousands and hundreds and fifties and, and so forth, uh, and have these people set up their, um, you know, they're set up as a, someone who to, uh, adjudicate problems. So, um, the duties of the judges, you know, the idea of judges, of course, is not new. It started with, with Moses. And uh, the, as it turned out, the duties that they had during this time that we call in the book of Judges, uh, it was varied. You know, they, they were sort of like a mayor because they were in a, in a city uh, generally. And they could also be the town marshal, kind of a, a thing, you know, for law and order. And uh, then they were, uh, they too, they were prophets where uh, they would give forth, they would foretell, uh, forth tell the word of God. And uh, then in some cases they were generals. And so uh, you'll find that in, as we study this book of uh, Judges, that um, typical of our Bible it doesn't really sugarcoat a lot of stuff so that, you know, you had some, uh, some judges that, you know, they were a courageous Othniel, Othniel on the, the, uh, son-in-law of, uh, of, uh, Caleb. Uh, he was, you know, a courageous man. And then a lot of these guys, they, yes, they were very courageous people. Uh, but then some of them, um, they were, um, not so stellar when it came to their their morals, you know. Uh, look at Samson and his uh, some of the foolishness that he got into, and and so we'll we'll see all of these things as we go on. Now, eight of the tribes actually had had judges that are listed here in uh, in uh, the book, and perhaps the other tribes had judges, but uh, and, and I'm sure they did. They had some kind of administrative people that that would um, that they had to have. You know, that's just you just got to do that if you're going to be in a civilized society. But they they did not. They never showed up in the book of Judges, and that was uh, Reuben, Simeon, um, Gad, and Asher. Now, uh, Simeon, of course, they allied themselves through Judah. So um, the uh, judges with, uh, with Judah then uh, would fall in, uh, Ash, I mean, uh, Simeon would fall under that. So, And none of them led a united Israel. They just, it, uh, it just didn't happen. Uh, like I said, you'd have Judah and Simeon that came together and did some fighting. Uh, Judah and Benjamin got together and... Uh, they you know, took over Jerusalem for a time, and then um, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh they combined a little bit to uh, to um, take like Bethel and and so forth. But uh, no one person then came to um, came to the fore as a, a leader of all Israel. Okay, you didn't see that until later on when. Uh, Saul was then appointed, anointed as the king. The uh, timeline, I just kind of wanted to put this in some perspective as to when this stuff took place. Now, in 1446 BCE, that was the exodus from Egypt. All right. And then, uh, you know, 40 years later, the, the uh, conquest of Jericho and Canaan begins around 1406 BCE. Um, and then... We find this thing, um, uh, it was discovered, I think, in 1887 or something, this this uh, big tablet, I guess, a stone tablet. It's called the uh, um, uh, Merneptah Stel or Stele. I don't know how to pronounce that word, um, but um, it's the first non-biblical reference to the nation of Israel. And so 
uh, the date on it, it actually puts a date on it. What it what it is, it's a tablet that chronicles the victory of an Egyptian king over uh, some people that uh, he was he was fighting and uh, uh, one of those one of those people's uh, people groups was you know the nation of Israel down in the Negev and so that would have been uh, Judah and um, some of the uh, maybe Simeon but uh, that was the uh, the actual first reference to uh, a nation of Israel outside of the Bible. So, um, and so the, the whole period of the judges, uh, runs some, you know, 1400, that time frame, uh, roughly to about 1100 or 1050, something like that. About 300 uh, to 350 years is the, the time frame that we see in judges, you know, whereas, you know, the, the book of, uh, the book of Exodus, and Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that was um, yeah, about, uh, uh, well, if you, if you took uh, the, the few chapters that uh, talk about Moses' life, for the most part, though, it was only like 40 years of chronicling the, the history of Egypt, uh, Israel. But now these guys, this, this book here is like 350 years. And it ended uh, basically when Saul was anointed the king of Israel. Then the the period of the judges was over. And at that point, then after that, God's spokesman in, in Israel would be referred to as prophets and not judges. All right. So um, I wanted to uh, hear. Now, what I've done is I've included... Um, uh, some uh, timelines that uh, talk about uh, some of the other uh, some of the other uh, empires, other countries, other kings, and so forth that are happening at the same time as our Book of Judges, so that you can kind of keep it in perspective of of where this was, where it was all happening, and so forth. So. Um, you know, some of this stuff uh, maybe is not going to uh, uh, mean a whole lot to you. Uh, you know, I mean, like, uh, who in the world cares that uh, during the period of uh, judges in, you know, Othniel's time in 1340 to 1339, uh, oh, there we had old uh, King Amawandish uh, uh, up in the Hittite Empire, you know, uh, Unless you're a, a scholar of something, that doesn't certainly doesn't mean much to me. Um, I'd never even heard of Amawandish before that, uh, um, before looking into all this kind of stuff. So, uh, but there, in in some cases, then it's kind of interesting that the famous, you know, King Tut uh, Tutankhamun uh, there in in Egypt. Uh, you'll see that okay here he was during this this period of uh, of time uh, where where we're studying with the judges so it kind of puts it in perspective of of where where these people were um, looking over you know 13 uh, 13 17 BCE you got Ramesses uh, Ramesses one and then later Ramesses two and so that kind of helps you out so um, I did that. You know, all three, and what I'll what I'll end up doing is probably just each week I will repeat these. You know, just keep them up at the front of the uh, of the uh, lesson so that you can refer to these things. And please, you know, if if you would like, uh, it's kind of interesting. Pull pull these things off and make yourself a a, a, a file. Uh, electronic file of some sort with uh, with these things because having a good timeline like this uh, certainly for me it uh, it helps me to keep things um, in in perspective um, historically so that I know what was going on in the rest of the world and um, um, so you know as and we'll talk about it later on uh, around 1220 BCE. Uh, we, we see these uh, uh, the invasion of the 
the sea people that uh, basically they uh, they destroy the Hittite Empire and uh, basically you know they're they're pretty formidable foes because they destroyed many uh, empires cultures and so forth these we don't really know a lot of you know history doesn't tell where they you know what islands they came from or what sea whatever but uh, they had a, a higher technology in that they had a good a good grasp of how to make iron weapons which were far superior to the bronze weapons that uh, that Israel had and eventually what happened these guys the the sea peoples the Phoenicians they were called they eventually became known as the Philistines and um, so and then here's the final final uh, final uh, timeline that chronicles it all the way down until where um, where King Saul is anointed and uh, that ends of course the uh, the period of the judges so um, now here is that uh, uh, Merneptah Stell that I was, was uh, talking about they found this um, you know, and I, I think they found it in, in Israel. And um, it has, of course, it's, it's full of, uh, you know, hieroglyphics there, which is, you know, a written language that somehow or another they have, um, over the years, the, they have um, learned how to translate things uh, with this. And, you know, how they do it, I, a lot of these things are just pictorial. And, um, you know, the written language, uh, the first known written languages were the Egyptian hieroglyphics. <coughs> um, and then there was one other that, uh, and those, those were developed around 2000 BCE. So basically, um, six or 700 years before the time of the uh, judges. Now here is, here's a, a place here. This is where they're talking about Israel is laid waste and his seat is no more. And of course they, they, it reads from uh, right to left, just like Hebrew does. Um, and so another thing that um, occurred during this time frame was that they discovered a, a piece of a stone or how, now how they figured this out I have no clue but anyway they they say that this is the first recorded musical score and it's uh, a hymn um, and it's called Hurrian hymn number six I don't know what happened to one two three four and five but uh, this one is Hurrian hymn. Uh, number six, and evidently is some kind of a, a song to one of the ancient deities that they they had. But it, uh, what it does, it gives a musical notation somehow. So kind of interesting stuff uh, that happened. Also, and and if you care, uh, that's also they. I think the Chinese developed the use of uh, chopsticks around this time of of. Um, human development before that maybe they just ate with their fingers i'm not sure but uh that's that was kind of what was happening during this time in um in uh, the rest of the world and that's what i'm going to try to do as we as we go through this is come up with some things that uh um maybe kind of show where we were in human development in the civil civilization of the of the world all right, so are there any comments or questions so far? Something that you would like me to look up and try to figure out? Okie dokie. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll start then with, um, with the uh, scriptures for tonight. We're just going to basically get through chapter one uh, tonight. Um, now it came to pass after the death of Joshua that Bnei Israel acquired inquired of Adonai, saying, "Who will be the first to go up uh, for us against the Canaanites to attack them?" Adonai said, "Judah will go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand." Judah then went uh, said to his brother Simeon, um, "Come up with me to my allotted territory, so that I that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I also will go." 
with you into your allotted territory. So Simeon went with him. When Judah went up, Adonai uh, delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. They struck down 10,000 of them at Bezek, and they found Adoni uh, Bezek uh, in Bezek and uh, engaged him in battle and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. All right, so uh, this... Um, uh, the the timing of this verse is, is kind of confusing, and it, you know, I, I would get several uh, reading the several uh, different commentators and so forth. You get a little; it's a little confusing to me because you know, the right at the beginning says that it came to pass after the death of, of Joshua uh, that you know Canaan is. I mean, that uh, Judah then is selected to go up against the Canaanites, but then it goes on and it talks about all of this stuff. And then in, in uh, the second chapter, verse 9, it describes the death of, of Joshua at that point. So did this happen right at the end of Joshua's uh, life, or did it happen after he had died? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, terribly important. Maybe it is. I don't know. So anyway... Uh, it was definitely right toward the end of Joshua's life, if not afterwards. And so we do know that there was no designated successor to Joshua. You remember that uh, when Moses was getting to the end of his days, uh, he had al always had his second-hand man there. Um, uh, his number two was Joshua. And, uh, you know, he could always send Joshua out to do whatever, um, whatever needed to be done. So, um, but in this case, and, and, you know, they actually had a formal commissioning of Joshua as the successor to, to uh, Moses. Um, but th that was also different times and, and uh, in that Israel was still one mass, even though they were tribal, they were still together very, very closely. They had not gone into the land and they had not scattered out over the land. So um, this was different and Joshua did not have a successor. Then, um, so when it talks about then that B'nai Israel inquired of Adonai, that would have had to been, you know, the leaders of the various tribes. They decided, okay, uh, we need to go ahead and do maybe what God had told us to do, imagine that, and uh, defeat the Canaanites, get rid of them, and, and push them on out. So they went to um, probably, you know, I would imagine, uh, just I'm, it's uh, assuming here, that, uh, but they went to Shiloh, and uh, they would go to the high priest, and they would ask, okay, uh, which uh, which tribe goes first, and uh, maybe they use the Urim and Thummim, you know, the two stones. Maybe they had some other way, you know, that maybe they drew, you know, drew straws. I don't know, but the way that uh, that God had set it up was using the uh, Urim and Thummim uh, through the hands of the the high priest. At any rate, uh, that's what uh, Judah came out. Uh, on top, and they were uh, um, they were the ones that went to, then went to war. Um, so, a lot of the territory that is described here then is uh, it was assigned. To, it was it was territory that was assigned to Judah in the beginning. So, what they're doing is they're just going out and doing their. Um, um, due diligence there, I guess it was, and, and to clean up the territory that was given to them. Now, they mentioned this guy, this uh, uh, Adoni Bezek, and what what all that means is that uh, it means king or lord of Bezek. It was a town, uh, and he was, you know, he's a pretty ruthless kind of guy, and so supposedly, you know, he had, he had maimed, we'll find out, he had maimed a lot of other people during his reign, you know, what he did was he chased them and, and uh, he uh, cut off the, he'd find a king 
and he'd cut uh, uh, cut off their thumbs and their big toes. Then that way they couldn't hold a sword and they couldn't run. So um, um, anyway, we'll go ahead and, and look at that. Um, um, the town of Bezik called Kerbet uh, Ibzik. It's uh, it's in the West Bank. I guess if that's the town, there's there's some speculation as what the town was really like. Uh, some writers said that it was a, a, a city not far from uh, uh, Jerusalem, and in that case, it could have very well been within the Ju uh, Judah uh, Judean territory, the, the territory of Judah. But if it was this uh, Kerbet uh, Ibsik, it's up <clears throat> in. Um, in about halfway between the Dead Sea and the uh, Sea of Galilee, and to the to the uh, west of the Jordan River, and so that would not that would have been more in like uh, Ephraim or Manasseh's territory. Uh, so you know, I, I tend to think that perhaps it was more down toward uh, toward Jerusalem. But anyway, uh, you know, they they fielded a team and and. Um, um, they said that uh, they they killed ten thousand of the soldiers that uh, that uh, this Adoni Bezek had had um, uh, put on the field against Israel. So, um, looking at um, the the other the next. Um, uh, Verses here, although uh, Adonai Bezek fled, they pursued him, caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. So Adon uh, Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings have their thumbs and big toes cut off. Uh, they used to pick scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. They brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. So, um, uh, you know, this is one of those kind of a deals where... Uh, <clears throat> Israel, you know, they, they did this uh, to this king. It's not what God told them to do. He never told them that, okay, take the, your, your capt uh, captives and torture them and so forth. He said, no, do that and uh, just if you capture them. Well, they, you, you go ahead and execute them because I want them out of the land. <clears throat> you don't... Uh, uh, don't take prisoners. You just take people and uh, uh, kill them. And that was, the, you know, they were under judgment. The the um, Canaanite uh, land was such that, uh, you know, they, they found the, you know, archaeologically they can put together that the Canaanite cultures that the Israelites found here was was very highly developed. It was, uh, they had, um, you know, their architecture was far, it's far surpassed what Israel was doing at that time. And, you know, they, they found that, you know, when Israel would come in and take over uh, some area that had been part of uh, the Canaanite culture, that uh, you they could tell the differences in the architecture because, um, basically the Canaanites had built stone homes, uh, where the, the stones were fitted together and they had mortar in them, uh, that held them together. Whereas the, uh, uh, the Israelites, when they came in, <clears throat> they would kind of stick, uh, um, you know, just stones on top of each other. They weren't really fitted all that well and they didn't use mortar. So, um, the the sophistication of the Canaanites was was superior to the Israelites, and it's not too hard to understand. In that, the Israelites had been they'd been slaves for uh, you know hundreds of years, and they're only forty fifty years out of slavery, so they had not time to uh, they had not had time to develop. Uh, a culture um, and uh, the skills uh, skill set, um, you know, and 
the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the uh, Tabernacle, that sort of thing. Those were special cases where God gave them a special anointing of the Holy Spirit and special um, special uh, gifts that allowed them to um, to uh, make you know make the Ark and the and the uh, tabernacle along with the you know the various instruments the uh table of showbread the uh, uh menorah the you know the altar of incense and all the other other things that they they actually came up with and made so uh, but the uh, you know their their treatment against uh, of or their treatment of the king here this adoni bezek uh was definitely not what God intended them for uh, to do, um, and uh, you know, they're, they're the thing they were supposed to do: go in there and wipe them out. But <clears throat> you know, they disobeyed there, and, uh, and this is just repeated time and time again in Judges, where um, you know they would take possession of a land, and instead of driving the enemies out, the 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 people out, uh, they just kind of and I said, okay, no, we're not going to do that. And um, so um, this this guy here, uh, we don't know if they executed him in Bezek or that he just bled out and died once uh, um, once he got to Jerusalem. We don't know. But the Jerusalem was the next on the list of, of conquests. So uh, that's where the guy died. And the idea that he had, he had uh, defeated uh, 70 kings, well, there weren't 70 kings uh, to be defeated. Uh, so these exaggerations like that were common among the, in the Middle East uh, at that time where, you know, they would, uh, uh, it's kind of like fishing stories. You know, the more often you tell them, um, the the bigger the fish get. And uh, <clears throat> I know uh, there's a couple of us here that, uh, served in uniform for a while and uh, I know that when we get back to the uh, academy with our classmates uh, Alan and I know that the stories uh, uh, as they get retold they they get embellished uh, sometimes you know and uh, uh, perhaps that's the way these kings were the more they told the story of their conquest it got a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger so um you know, it's not something that I'm totally unfamiliar with. So, um, but uh, we go on and, and uh, so then the, uh, the children of Judah attacked Jerusalem, captured it, struck it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. Afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight the Canaanites that dwelt in the hill country in the Negev and in the lowland. Judah then marched against the Canaanites who had dwelt in Hebron. The former name of Hebron was uh, Kiriath Arba, and they defeated uh, Sheshai, uh, Ahim, Ahiman, and uh, Talmai. And from there, Judah marched against the inhabitants of Debir. Uh, the former name of Debir was Kiriath Sefer. All right. <clears throat> so um, when, we, when we get to these... Um, these these guys here this this part of the of the narrative the the capture of jerusalem evidently was just a temporary thing because um you know they 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 burned part of the city but then they said well they never drove the jebusites out well the jebusites were in a walled section that would uh later became known as the city of David because he was able to get in there, capture the city and, um, and drive the Jebusites out, kill them and uh, drive them out. Um, and then that wall city became the city of David. And, um, that was, that was actually when the Jebusites were defeated. They, they never were, um, defeated or, or you know in in practice they, they you know they stayed there the whole time and what uh, what uh, judah and uh, benjamin had done was just to burn the the, the parts uh, outside the city walls uh and inflicted um, you know pretty much uh, minor damage uh, 
with the Jebusites. But in the long run, what they did was that for the next couple of hundred years, 300 years, the, the Jebusites were able to just stay there in their country. Now, the names of this guy, this uh, Sheshai, Ahaman, and Talmai, those are Aramean names that they suggest that these people that are uh, that were there in uh, in Hebron were somehow related to uh, the people that uh, uh, settled and, and uh, controlled Damascus. So they were somehow related to to the Syrians up there, the Arameans, as it were. And um, so that's kind of an interesting side note, I guess you could say, uh, from that. So are there, uh, okay, so are there any questions so far that we got? Anything? Okay, so let's go ahead here. Kind of an interesting story. So Caleb said, whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him will I give my daughter Aksa for a wife. So Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger kinsman, uh, captured it. So uh, Caleb gave him his daughter, Aksa, as a, a wife. Now it came about when she came to him, she, was per she had persuaded Othniel to ask her father for a field. And when she got off her donkey, I guess looking at uh, uh, the field, uh, Caleb asked her, said, what do you need? She said, give me a blessing. And for that, uh, he says, you've given me land in the Negev, but you should have also given me springs of water. So Caleb says, uh, you know, Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. So, um, you know, here we, uh, we have a kind of a, I don't know, kind of an interesting story here of, uh, of um, family interaction, as it were. Now, this guy, Othniel, uh, they say, you know, he was the younger brother, and uh, I've heard other people say, well, no, that's, that's a little bit too close that, um, you know, that uh, he would have, uh, it was for more probably a, uh, a nephew of uh of caleb so that the, at least there was a little bit of blood separation there although it wouldn't it wouldn't have been that uh that you know unusual i suppose to marry a first cousin but uh, you know some people say well no it's, it's probably and there is there is some uh when you look at the genealogies there yeah, a little bit of a little bit of fudge in there so um this guy othniel was uh I, obviously a, a bold warrior and uh he later then became the the first judge and that would have been in in uh, judah of course because that's where uh he was uh, caleb was uh, uh was judean and um so um you know, that's just kind of an interesting thing. Now, Caleb gave his daughter land, and then she went back to him and says, hey, Pop, this land doesn't have any water on it. What good is it? So I need some water. And so he said, oh, my bad. So he gave her not only, you know, lower springs, he gave her upper springs too. And then there's a whole lot of uh, um, commentary that I, that I read on uh, what it meant by having the upper springs and the lower springs. And, uh, it, a lot of it seemed, uh, kind of, um, sermon fodderish, uh, as to why that was. But, uh, anyway, he, he heard his daughter and, uh, said, yeah, you're right. I'm going to give you this so that that would give her a, a better chance of success because, you know, land without water, is uh, is nothing they just couldn't do anything with it all right so uh now this um this incident you know it is also related uh or it's a re retold um in uh, joshua 15 i think uh, 15 through 19 so uh that took place before joshua died so the writer probably recorded it again um because the event was a significant part of the of the conquest of Judah's inheritance, and uh, you know, it kind of gives the reader a, an introduction to the first judge. Now, um, 
Now, Caleb, obviously, he awarded, uh, rewarded Othniel's bravery by giving him his daughter's hand in marriage. And uh, then um, the daughter said, yeah, I've been blessed, but I need a little bit more blessing here. And she was not, of course, it's her father. So he, she's not afraid to go to him and said, uh, hey, I need a little bit more. And so, um, uh, you know, these, these springs that they had, uh, they were the area around the beer. And so to, you know, if you've ever been to the Negev desert, it is dry, dry, dry. So yeah, the, the springs would have been extremely important, uh, to, for that area to be able to flourish. All right. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the children of the Kenite, Moses, uh, father-in-law went up to the children of Judah in the city of the palm, from the city of Palms to the wilderness of uh, Judah, which is in the Negev of Arad. They went and settled with the people. Then Judah went uh, with his brother Simeon. They defeated the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath. Uh, they utterly destroyed it. And thus the name of the city was called Hormah. And uh, so also Judah captured Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with, with its territory. Uh, Adonai was with Judah, and he possessed the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. All right. Um, the Kenites, who were these guys? They were, they said they were the children of Jethro, who was a Midianite, uh, but obviously they had they had uh, attached themselves, even though Jethro didn't do it, um, then his some of his progeny decided they were going to go with the Israelites, and they went with them, and they settled. They were up at uh, at Gilgal uh, with them. There's that's where this um, uh, city of Palms is. It's it's up near Jericho, and of course uh, Jericho and Gilgal was not that far from Jericho. And they first settled in there, and then they went down from there uh, into uh, the territory of Judah and said, okay, we're with you guys, and we're going to go and help you fight these uh, the Canaanites. So um, the um, it, show, it says here, if you look at the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, um, Israel, or Judah anyway, uh, went in there and they, they defeated, uh, they captured Gaza and its territory and Ashkelon and Ekron and all that. And it's kind of funny because then in the, if you look in the Septuagint, the Greek version of it, they said that they did not capture Gaza uh, and its territory or Ashkelon with its territory or Ekron with its territory. I mean, completely opposite. So you have to go back to uh, it's, it's one of those, those kind of things that, um, I say all the time, if you want to know something, you have to go back to the original language because translations, no matter how good they are, they are going to portray a certain bias and it could be a, a bias that would actually be hundred percent wrong. So, um, but it did say that they, they possessed the hill country, but down in the valley, the flat ground, uh, they couldn't do it because, they didn't have chariots. Well, that's a cop out because the Israelites, all throughout their conquest, had been uh, uh, they had uh, been up against uh, horrendous odds. In some cases, they were outnumbered a hundred to one. And guess what? At the end of the day, uh, they they were victorious because God Himself had fought for them, and and um, you know they. Uh, the, the one time up there in, in the northern part of the country um, where uh, the five kings came up against them. And what happened? God sent hailstones uh, that uh, killed more of the enemy than Israel was able to do in the battlefield. So, uh, and there's some speculation that, okay, they may have been hailstones. They may have been just stones that God picked up and flung at the, uh, at the enemy. But anyway, he killed them. And uh, Israel was victorious then. And so he could have done the same thing here 
but uh, you know the Judah as well. You know these guys got chariots, and uh, uh, so what's the what's the big deal with that? Chariots um, could just pretty much bowl over infantry, and so you know that was uh, it would it would be like um, you know if if you had. Uh, to go up against a modern army with their uh, their automatic weapons, and all you had were the old uh, M1s and uh, the uh, the O3 Springfields or something like that uh, against you know the modern modern weapons that we have today, uh, it would not have been a pretty sight um, if you're just talking about in the natural, but um, that was the difference in the technology between these these people that had the iron uh, chariots or iron wheels on their chariots. You know, the Egyptians had that. And um, that was one of the things then that later on the sea people or the Philistines, um, Phoenicians, and then later the Philistines, that was the advantage they had because throughout the world, there was the world was still pretty much in the Bronze Age, well, these guys had somehow figured out how to uh, uh, work in iron, and of course, iron being a much superior and a, a much greater and, and so far superior weapon than uh, bronze swords and so forth were. So, um, anyhow, that's uh, that's what we have here. That Judah went ahead and they took the land. And uh, so anyway, this is recorded. They gave uh, Hebron to Caleb. That was already in, in um, uh, that was already been recorded in Joshua. And um, so he drove out the three sons of Anak, the, you know, the, the, the three giants. Um, but the, uh, it reiterates that the children of Benjamin way up in the north part of the Judean territory did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites continued to live with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day, meaning that to this day, meaning as of the writing of this, this book, which would have been before the uh, advent or the, the life of David, when David came in there and then defeated the Jebusites. So um, now that was in Joshua 14. And, um, but uh, the the idea that uh, Caleb got Hebron, it was in Joshua 14. But maybe it was just now that it was being totally completed. The uh, the details, uh, you know, like I said, the Bible is not always um, uh, sequential. There's a lot of the stuff that is is uh, happens all at the same time or before and after. You know, the the story gets told. Uh, a little bit different uh, sequence in the time in the uh, in the time uh, timeline, and so we already explained how the Jebusites occupied the uh, the city of David, and that's when David captured uh, Jebus and uh, made it uh, the capital there. So, um, so this talks about then the the house of Joseph marched against uh, Bethel. That's uh, that's uh, Ephraim and Manasseh combined. They went against Bethel, and uh, the Lord was Adonai was with them, and they sent people to spy out Bethel. And um, the uh, the former name of the city was Luz, and the the scouts saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, "Show us the entrance to the city, and we will deal kindly with you." Uh, so he showed them the entrance into the city, and probably some way of getting around the defenses. Uh, that would what it would mean to me. And they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man go free with all his family. So the man went into the land of the Hittites, built a city, named it Luz, which it is its name to this day. So um, the uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, they combined, they went up against uh, Bethel, and uh, their their treatment of this man was actually contrary to what God had uh, had told them to do, because He said, "You know, you go in there and you wipe these people out. Don't give them a um, uh, a survivor." And you know, it was later on that King Saul uh, that he allowed uh, um, basically the ancestors of of Haman to to live, and um, um, 
it, it caused problems for, for Israel there in the, in the, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, in the story of, of Esther. Um, so this was this idea of the incomplete obedience to God was a common theme in, in judges. It just over and over and over again. So coming up, uh, you know, this 27 through 30 talks about Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its village or Tanakh or its, his villages. And they went through the, the different, uh, different ones or the inhabitants of Megiddo. Well, Megiddo is important because that was, uh, that commanded, uh, if you, if you go to Megiddo today, uh, you, it, it's over the Jezreel Valley and, uh, uh, that was a uh, Solomon eventually turned that into a mighty fortress uh, so that he could command that valley. It was on the trade route, so Megiddo would have been a one a one that that should have should have been captured, and it was not. Um, and um, so Canaanites this says resolved to dwell in that land, and when Israel became strong. They put the Canaanites to forced labor, but didn't drive them out. So the Canaanites did say, well, survival at any cost. We're overwhelmed. There's more of them than there are of us. Uh, okay, we'll do a peace treaty. We'll become uh, uh, laborers to do the work that the Israelites don't want to do. And uh, But at least we'll live. So um, same thing with Ephraim. They didn't uh, drive out the people at uh, Gezer, which that was down kind of, that was on the coast over there. And um, so it said the Canaanites, they dwelt among Israel. And Zebulun didn't drive out the inhabitants of Kitchen. It just goes on all these different ones um, that, okay, they didn't drive them out, but they forced them into, into um, you know, forced labor of some sort. And um, um, what they're talking about there was the half tribe of Manasseh that lived on the west side of the Jordan. That's who they were talking about there. That they didn't drive out the the inhabitants of Beth Shean and, and Tanakh and, and Dor and so forth. Um, and it just seemed like it, there was really no reason for it. It was just that uh, they just weren't really interested in in uh, fielding uh, soldiers on you know and going out and going against the enemy. They just well. Just let them live, you know, live and live and let live kind of a thing. And uh, uh, easier to let them just make treaties with us, which, again, was a totally against what God wanted them to do because they were under judgment. Israel did not execute judgment like they should have. And um, so uh, that's, um, uh, again, the idea in Judges was that they were told to do one thing and then it was a disobedience and uh, they suffered the consequences for it later on. And they're going on. Asher didn't drive out the, the inhabitants of uh, Akko or Zidon or Akla, you know, all those hard names. And so the Asherites lived among the, the Canaanites and, you know, they... They were assimilated. They were close to all of these foreign religions, and so they took those things up. Uh, Naphtali, uh, same kind, of, same story. And um, you'll notice that uh, um, I mean that it, it's just the same thing over and over again. Canaanites dwelled with them, and uh, okay, they made a treaty with them, and they became a forced labor, um, and. Uh, so, you know, just over and over again, same thing, <clears throat> totally contrary to what God had told them to do. And then the, finally, uh, these these verses here, that the Amorites forced the children of Dan. Now, here's the problem. They didn't drive these guys out. So now, as one of the, the Amorites, they, they forced the uh, children of Dan <clears throat> up into the hill country and away from their actual inheritance. Uh, and wouldn't let them come down to the valley where you know the water was the uh, the good land and so forth. So basically, they're making the children of uh, of Dan live in uh, not so good conditions, so they couldn't thrive, and uh, uh, they just didn't go against them. Um, but um, then, when uh, you know Manasseh and uh, Ephraim came against some of these people. They, they forced them into forced labor. But 
the uh, the rest of the Amorites, Dan actually eventually doesn't say it here, but it'll it'll say it later on that Dan, the uh, children of Dan, they basically eventually they just left and they went up north where there was less opposition to them and and they could uh, uh, live live in uh, you know relative peace. Although you know they were. Um, they just had to take leftovers at that point, but they could have, they could have taken these because, you know, if they'd gone against them, God would have been with them and they would have been, uh, they would have uh, been victorious, but they just didn't do it. So anyway, that ends up, um, uh, chapter, uh, one of judges.